Hello everyone, this is Javiera, once more for 1133podcast.com, and today I am with Andrea Page. Andrea is the director of the detox program at Yoga Barn, which is the largest yoga studio in Asia. She also has her own publications, articles, and to be honest, she has amazed me with how knowledgeable she is about the physical, emotional, and spiritual health and well-being. So... I know many of us are in the search of, of well-being, of having better lives, on having healthier bodies and mental health and emotional health all together. And so I am thrilled to have you with us, Andrea, on 1133 Podcast. And to start this interview, could you give us a short introduction of who you are? Mm, I'm a naturopathic doctor uh, and yoga teacher trainer. And I exist in this world to bring people to their own inner sense of aliveness. And so whether that's through yoga and expansion of consciousness, uh, or whether that's through this physical human body and health and awakening a sense of vitality inside of people. That's mm -hmm. my job on this earth this time around. So what, if, what I'm feeling here... Andrea, is that there is so much more than just talking about detox. Because at the beginning, when I was coming to interview you, uh, the topic was going to be to talk about what a detox was. But just being with you for five to ten minutes, I realized the depth of what you're holding. So you just mentioned, and you correct me before, you said it's not only detox, it's about mm -hmm. health. So the first question I would I would like to ask you is, what's the difference for you? Yeah, um, detoxification is a natural byproduct of health. The body naturally is made to detoxify. It's just like any closed system, whether that's an ecosystem or whether that's an office building, right? There's a way where they have these natural cleaning systems built in, right? The maid or the housekeeping comes in every day at 6 a.m. and every night at 6 p.m., whatever it is. Um, our body is the same way. The thing is today, though, that our bodies have, let's say, staggered away from a place of health where these natural detoxification systems are no longer working. And so that's what's brought about this whole almost new age craze about detox. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what I do in empowering health is bringing back the way that the body is meant to work and balance and so that detoxification is an implication. It's implied by going back to health because health is making sure that those detoxification systems work. Does that make sense? Perfect. So you would say that uh, that we normally would have a system, like in a healthy system, we will be detoxifying naturally? Yeah. That happens in a natural way. Yeah, and so the, the simplest way that I can hit home and um, allow people to understand this mm -hmm. is that the human body is meant to be pooping once per meal per day. So if you're having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, one should be going to the toilet three times per day. And in the modern world, that seems like an absolute crazy statement to make because the truth of the matter is that more than 80% of the world is constipated. And I know that from my clinical work as a career colon hydrotherapist, and I know that from my epidemiological work as an anthropologist in the field where I've been to 25, 30 countries and talked to people about their poop. And how often they poop and, and things like that. And so, um, that, that, I mean, that data seems crazy, but it, it's so clear because for me, constipation is going less than you're supposed to be going. Something goes in, something should come out, just like babies, just like dogs. And why do you think is the main reason why the world is constipated? Mm, I don't think there's one main reason. I think it's yeah. a combination of reasons. Um, I made actually, Maybe two weeks ago for a client, I made this really cool constipation map that I should probably publish somewhere. But I mean, the the factors coming in are first and foremost, massive dehydration, like we've never seen before as a species. Humans are incredibly dehydrated. Um, and that is only for lack of drinking water? No, not at all. I mean, dehydration is another thing in and of itself. And yeah. I, I, as a medical practitioner more and more I'm starting to really see that all conditions of disease or illness come down at their root to some form of dehydration. Um, and so it's a chronic dehydration whereby the body uses and loses three liters of water per day. And so if we're not replacing that already, that's day after day after day. 
beyond that, the quality of water that we're drinking in the world of today is 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 very low. I mean, any kind of tap water, if it's riddled with pharmaceuticals or like the the water processing plants, um, largely haven't been updated to compete really with the pharmaceutical runoff that we're getting from the little boy next door who has Ritalin, right? And right. so you're drinking that in your water, let alone a lot of water processing. For example, what we have here in Bali is uh, through filtration processes, which are very effective, like reverse osmosis, incredibly effective filtration, so effective that it also filters out the minerals in the water. And so water without minerals is not understood by the human body. So it won't be, it won't actually be absorbed by the, the cells to be held on to. And it'll rather just kind of be wetness passing through. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's resulting in, in dehydration. cellular dehydration. And so it's the quality of water that we're drinking. It's the fact that we're not drinking enough water. It's the fact that we have incredibly dehydrating diets. Yeah. Any food that's salty, cooked, dried, fried, right? Um, any food that's of an animal product base is inherently salty in nature. And so all of these things continue to dehydrate the body. Anything that's dried, like bread, right? something as simple as bread, is going to require water from your body to digest. So we see, I mean, easily, I mean, when you look at something like coffee and alcohol, very acidic beverages that are incredibly dehydrating. One cup of coffee will dehydrate the body to the effect of four glasses of water. Right? Alcohol double its volume at least. And so when we take that into consideration, we see that, oh yeah, easily, our lifestyle and our habits today and the fact that we're not giving our body what it needs is going to result in a massive dehydration. So that's the first, let's say, cause of constipation would be that <laughs> dehydration. Um, and then from there, we, we go on to look at the fact that um, poo is taboo. So there's a huge psychology behind it. Uh, and this stems from even when people are, are toddlers, you're growing up. Right, because mommy told you either, oh, bad boo, bad boy, don't touch your poo, it's stinky, it's smelly, right? Or good boy, like when you're learning to to, to potty train, I'm kind of I'm dictating as I would to my dog, but like, <laughs> yeah, good good boy, little Johnny, like you you made a poop, and so there's this extreme dichotomous good and bad with poop, and um, people tend to rely on the the bad of the this is smelly, dirty, bad. I should like I can't poop in front of anyone. I can't poo at this person's house, I can't poo at work, I need to be in my own safe space, I won't talk about my poo. But as a career colon hydrotherapist, throughout my years working, as soon as I say I'm a colon hydrotherapist, it's like the floodgates open and that good side comes out and people are just so excited to talk about their poo and they won't stop. And so it's this this polarity that we have that's the reality of um, the neurosis, I would say, the <laughs> psychological imbalance. For sure. And so that's another adding factor uh, to constipation. And a, a big part of it is people not giving themselves time. Yeah. To you mean time? Right. Really? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. There's a whole kind of standard process that I go through with people to, to teach them how to poop more. Um, well, and, I'm uh, totally intrigued about this. <laughs> this is such a... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it includes it includes going to the toilet and squatting there, the biomechanical position that we're supposed to be pooping in, squatting, yeah. right, for 10 minutes, getting your mind off of things, reading, playing a game on your phone, whatever it is that can allow the mind to leave. And as the mind leaves, the body can do what it knows very well how to do and it wants to do. And um, so that results in in a poop, right? Or the body healing itself, um, which is that natural process of elimination so that then the energy can go elsewhere and, and the body has more space to, to be and be healthy and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, yeah, giving yourself time going when you don't even think you have to, because the truth is that people have said no so many times to their bowel movement. Oh no, I'll just hold it in. Right. right. Ever since you were little, yes. right? that the body stops asking once you say no so many times. You see that? And so going and opening the window allows the body to walk through. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you, what is also the relationship or the influence that the emotional the emotions have on constipation? Yeah, so that's a whole other part of it also. Uh, we hold stress in the abdom abdominal area because this is the only area um, in our body that's not protected by bones, 
right? So you look everywhere else, even your rib cage, even your shoulders, all of this has uh, bony protection as like a bit of an armor. When you come to your belly area, right, where intestines are stored, there's absolutely no bones. Everything is held up by skin tags, right? It's between the pelvis and the thoracic cage. Um, and it's this very vulnerable area. And um, because of that, we tend to close off and hold in that area in order to protect it. And so stress is a form of protection, essentially, because the reason we're stressed is because we feel threatened in some way. And so on a physiological level, what that results in, of course, is, is constipation. And so this is another one of the many factors in constipation is stress. It's not only we're dehydrated, we're not giving ourselves enough time. Our diet is not uh, water-containing fibrous matter, fruits and vegetables. We're simply not eating enough. Um, but yeah, for sure, stress plays a huge, huge role in holding that in the body. And So I, it's, it's really interesting that we're talking about such a specific uh, thing in our body. It's just, you know, constipation and how feelings are related to that and you were talking about health in general, and this is just one indicator of health. So what other other things in our life that will tell you as an expert that someone is ha is having a good health Yeah. or not? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting that you say one indicator of health. Uh, for me, I mean, poop is, is almost the greatest indicator of health because um, if you think about it, if there's not waste leaving, then what you're creating inside is a cesspool, a rubbish bin inside. Right? And so even if you look great and shiny and sparkly on the outside, if you're creating a cesspool inside, right, there will never be health over the long term. And so this is when we see disease come up the age of 40 and on. And I mean, even younger today, you hear a lot of even 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds diagnosed with things like cancer, right? which finally a, a new study just came out of uh, New York. I can't wait to start talking about it more. Um, not a new study, sorry, a clinical study showing that they claim 70 to 80% of cancers are preventable. Right. And for me, the statistic is actually much higher than that. I would say more than that is preventable. But um, showing that this is the fun foundational essence of health. And so one of the lectures that I give sometimes is um, going back to the foundations of health. And this is most of the work that I tend to do because I find that um, people don't have these foundations of health already there, and yet they're trying to work with their vitamin B12 levels, or their this and that, or their thyroid is out of balance. Well, anything that's out of balance is out of balance because you don't have the foundation built. And so for me, the four foundations are hydration, right, which we already talked about. Yes. Elimination, which we're talking about in terms of poop, right? And there's other forms of elimination, like getting what you need to say off your chest, right, being honest with life. That's a big form of elimination. Uh, but on a, on a physical or physiological level, hydration, elimination, respiration, so actually breathing long, slow, expansive breaths, mm. right, rather than barely breathing or breathing shallowly. Um, this is a big part of it. And it doesn't mean breathing more. It means breathing more expansively, breathing longer, breathing fuller. Um, and that as act of respiration is also what controls the nervous system. And so, and of course, stress, the breath can bring us back to that place of relaxation. And that's a lot of the gift that yoga gives to the modern world today. Um, and it's also respiration at a cellular level. It's this exchange of cells eating and pooping and eating and pooping, right? The trillions of cells in your body. That's what they're doing all day. Just like you at a macroscopic level, your cells at a microscopic level are eating and pooping. And so what are you feeding the cells? And when we look at what makes the cells poop, quite often it's also what makes us poop. Things like leafy green vegetables. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the color green specifically is the most alkalizing um, color quality in, in fruits and vegetables. And so the more of that we have, the more we're going to encourage respiration on the cellular level and detoxification of the blood. Right. So we're back to elimination and how these are interrelated. Right? We already learned uh, hydration and elimination are interrelated. But um, from there, the fourth pillar of the foundation of health is then restoration. And this is one that can't be underestimated, but the, the essence of allowing um, rest, relaxation. And that sounds simple, and it's quite intangible for many people. But I, when I work with it, especially when I'm teaching yoga or teaching yoga teacher trainings, I work with it in a very tactile way where you can tell the quality of your nervous system when it lets go. Right? When you feel that full relaxation, you realize you weren't in it before. 
And it's the feeling you have after after Shavasana, like after a really good yoga class, that ah, that that blissful, just content, peaceful, slow moving state where everything's okay. And um, what that is on a physiological level is it's a shift in the autonomic nervous system that dictates between that stress response, the flight or fight, you've probably heard of it, that's the sympathetic setting of the autonomic nervous system and then the other setting is the relaxation response right the parasympathetic and the thing is this kind of works like a light switch at any one time one of these or the other is more active and um it's easy when you start to track your own and this can tell you a lot about yourself and life and it can give you that witness consciousness of of yoga which is meditation to be able to live life with greater meaning and to unlock secrets of health to better understand your own body um, and so, for example, right now, we're sitting here, right? If you're just sitting here listening to me, and if, if your mind's not too active thinking about what other questions you might want to ask, then you're probably in parasympathetic, right? You can check that by if your stomach or your jaw is relaxed, how your belly, how your breath is, um, all of these things. Me, I'm more in sympathetic mode because I'm talking and I'm trying to express and there's a lot of passion and I personally have a lot of fire. And so when I teach, I tend to go into that stress response. And it's a good lesson for me to to back <laughs> off and stay in the relaxation response when I teach. But it depends on what I'm teaching, if it's restorative yoga or if it's a lecture on health, right? Different parts of myself I access. But like a very clear one is if um, a bear or a lion jumped through the window right now. And yes. Both of us would go like this exactly. and tighten up, right? Including that abdominal center, right? Um, including constipation, including stress, all of these things that we think about. It's all the same thing, right? But that's the sympathetic nervous system, the flight or flight response coming more active. And so all it takes to switch from one of these to the other is what you've known your whole life, 10 deep breaths, right? You hear someone else being mad and you say, hey, just hold on, take 10 deep breaths. Mm-hmm. That's all it takes. And um, so we have the power over this switch and and the reason that i talk about this so much and i'm talking about it right now is because this is what governs the rest of our physiology in terms of restoration and healing is really what i'm talking about obviously things like sleep are necessary but healing can and will only occur when that relaxation setting the parasympathetic nervous system is on healing cannot and will not ever occur when that stress response is on and so what is healing? Well, of course, any kind of repair on our body. Healing is also detoxification, pooping, <laughs> right? <laughs> healing is also being able to just reflect on life and healing is happiness. Healing is laughter, right? Healing is all of these things. And so all of that can only occur when that relaxation setting is more active. And so that's the fourth pillar of health is is allowing enough time for that relaxation, like true deep relaxation, not like, okay, I'm laying down on my bed, but I'm working on spreadsheets for work, which are very actually taxing on me mentally or physically um, or energetically. And so true, true, true relaxation. And so I always encourage people to find that however that is, whatever that is, if that's putting your legs up the wall and relaxing and breathing deeply for 15 minutes first thing in the morning and the last thing before you go to sleep, right? Or in the middle of the day, if that's time. Um, or if that's a restorative yoga class that you've gifted yourself, that's one of the best gifts that you could ever give. Um, so yeah, those are the four foundational pillars of health. And I find that most people don't have them fully in place. And I mean, I don't pretend to have, for me to have them fully in place. It's always a negotiation. It's always a rebalancing, um, because life gets in the way, right? Mm -hmm. I was just in Europe for two months and in Europe, people go to bed so late and they eat so late and all of this. And it just rocked rocked my foundational pillar of health so deeply that I really felt the effect because I know what it's like to be balanced and and be healthy in that way it's interesting that you mentioned oh, first of all I want to be grateful of the, the immense amount of knowledge that you're sharing and content so thank you for that I'm learning so much already um, but you just said that you know how it feels to be balanced right so I feel many people, me included at some points of my life, I I didn't know what it feels to be balanced. So how do you know? What, what's, what could you share about that? Mm, yeah, um, interesting. 
experimentation. Um, so whenever I'm teaching anything or whenever I'm communicating with people or whenever I'm sharing whatever my truths I've discovered are, I always say, please don't believe me, verify me. And one of my greatest crusades or goals in this is, is to help people, empower them to become a scientist in the living laboratory of their body. Right? That you start to pay attention because that's our greatest let's say, flaw today is that we simply don't pay attention. We're not listening to the messages that our body's always sending us. And so we need to really re-enliven and start listening in a way that um, we can respond and know that our body is always looking out for, for our best interest because the natural inherent thesis of any kind of holistic medicine is is that the body wants to heal itself. And especially what I practice, I'm a natural hygienist, natural hygiene, it's not only the body wants to heal itself, but it has the full capability and capacity to do so. We just have to give it the time and space so that it can. And so that's why I work with fasting, because fasting is the ultimate time and space. But So in terms of discovering that balance, I would say a lot of that's come from my fasting practice. Over the past 15 years, I've been experimenting with all different kinds of fasting and um, really the body, the human body, and I've fasted thousands of people. Um, and seeing how their bodies respond and uh, three days versus five days and what happens physiologically day after day after day and really what is to be discovered in longer fasts, in water fasts versus juice fasts versus juice feasts. And like there's just so much going on at a cellular level that um, in general, when we can stop the input, all of the chemical barrage, because even if you're eating whole natural food, it still is a chemical input into your body and your cells have to imbibe and decipher and break down all of that when we stop putting so much in right in fact we put almost nothing in if it's a water fast or only high quality fresh pressed liquids like a green juice fast then all of a sudden the body gets to start to process out all the things that it never had time to and you get to feel into a truer essence of what you are independent of all the stuff that you're constantly putting in and so that's what we do in, in fasting retreats is, first of all, there's the fasting, yes. and second of all, there's the retreat. And that part can't be underestimated either because um, I never, I mean, I, I've led retreats for several years, but I never understood what a true retreat was myself until I was writing my master's thesis. Um, and I did my master's research here in Bali, but then I procrastinated a little bit. I was working in Taiwan and didn't work on my thesis at all. <laughs> I hope my I hope my advisor doesn't listen to this. <laughs> and then uh, I, I left myself about two weeks. And so I went to the edge of the earth, as I could imagine it. I went to Palawan, which is the westernmost island in the Philippines. I went to the far north part of the island. And I rented a house 200 steps up on the side of a cliff. And I only came down about once a week or maybe twice a week. I had solar power. I had electricity. Uh, I had internet. And I wrote. I wrote and I wrote all day, every day. And that was a retreat. I literally retreated from the world. And I understood this is what it means to fully stop putting in input of other people and other people's ideas or other culture or anything and just fully be with myself. Right? And of course, I had a task in that in that setting of of writing, right? Yes. My my master's thesis in anthropology, but um, it but was, I would guess I, it also was so impactful in your life. Yeah, for sure. So, to to understand what that's like to to be up there and to to be alone and to process in that way and to be that far disconnected from the world. I mean, this is any yogi's journey, journey, right? You go and climb into a cave in the Himalayas. This is I did it in a very different way, but it was, it helped me understand the importance of retreat. That it's not just a fasting of food, right? But in, for example, the retreats that I lead at the yoga barn, there's this retreat away from your normal life, right? There's this beautiful setting, there's a family, a community that we build throughout the week that you're in this safe held space that's so different from your normal life and you get to explore and so just as your cells are processing and detoxifying on an energetic level or on a spiritual growth level, you're exploring and processing, right? And, and that's how the, the rebirth happens. And so, yeah. But in this case, what you have is the support of people around you, yeah. I would guess. Yeah. Ultimately, you're left for your own journey. 
Yeah, which is beautiful to watch as well because I, the way that I work in anything, if it's physically teaching anatomy or if it's um, teaching yoga in general or if it's teaching people how to teach yoga or if it's teaching people about health, I work in a way that's based on empowerment so that when I walk away, you do not need me, right? For ex like with yoga, if I'm adjusting someone, right, if I lift something higher, whatever, I'll cue exactly what muscles to engage so that as soon as I walk away, they're exactly where I left them, right? Quite often you'll see people adjust someone and then as soon as they let go, the person goes back to where they were, right? But the empowerment structure needs to be there for it to be really a self growth and self-inquiry, self-process. Um, and so that's the space we hold as well in the detox retreats and all of the facilitators that I work with um, and the healers that I use on the program, they're all pointing everyone back to themselves. And so even though there is all this support, it's support that just brings you back to yourself. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Andrea, the question that comes to me is that I would guess everyone is looking for a better lifestyle, like to feel better at a simple level, right? And one of the things that have been coming to my life is that food has a great impact on that. Somehow. I'm not an expert on that, but I've just been so curious about it. Yeah. So uh, many people, you know, they work 45 hours a week. And they, they're looking for a better way, like a better life in general. How, how relevant it is or how impactful it is to just make simple changes in your daily diet to have a, an impact in your the way you feel. Mm. Yeah, super, super, super relevant. Super Even when you easy. cannot go to a retreat, for example. Yeah, this is what I teach. Um, and I mean, I also I give away everything for free online. I have my own podcast where I record my lectures. And this is, yeah, the work that I aim to do. And um as a modern culture tend to think very linear, linearly where it's like, okay, that's my problem. Give me a solution for just that problem rather than holistically where it's like, okay, this is a system. Everything's connected. And as I start to sort out these foundations of health, for example, everything else will get more clear and better and flowing more smoothly. Um, and so it's, it's very, very easy. Um, I wouldn't say I have a formula, but if I did have a formula, it would be something that involved a whole lot more hydration. It would be something that involved simplicity. So not having so much. I mean, the modern human meal today has more than 50 ingredients on average. right? So paring that down, going back to simple, having dinner with only 10 ingredients or less. right? Simplify things, eat whole foods. That's going to be a big part of it. Um, and then from there, empowering your body to poop. Right, things like that, and certain foods that can do that. For example, bananas, cucumbers. I'm the reason why I have this large pile of cucumbers and lots of bananas over there is because I'm I'm actually doing essentially what you're asking right now. I'm taking two weeks right now in my life to write. Um, I'm going to call it the banana cucumber diet. I'm writing a book that's going to be a guide for that middle-aged woman, could be a man, but who is on the brink of cancer and uh, has so much held in toxicity, perhaps has been constipated for their entire life, perhaps, and not constipation like, Ugh! or going to the toilet two times a week. I mean, there are many, many, many women like that. But my definition of constipation is going less than once per meal per day, right. anything less than that. And so someone like this, who maybe isn't ready for a fast or can't come to Bali and do a detox retreat to completely change their life, what can they do starting tomorrow that will be non-threatening that will be empowering, that will bring them back to themselves to become their own scientist in their own body um, and, and really develop something. And so that's, that's what I'm writing right now. And it, it very clearly, strongly came through about a week and a half ago that I had to do this and I yes. had to do it now. And so this is essentially what I'm writing is what you're asking about, like, how can people make these small changes? Mm -hmm. But um, it takes... It takes inquiry. It takes learning from your own body because the work that I do, I often say, is... Uh, helping people close the circle of understanding that what we put in has a big effect of what happens in the body and how it comes out, or if it doesn't come out, is an indicator of how the whole circle is working or not. And um, in the nature, the way that I do my work or the, the, what makes it work, yeah, why I have such great success 
is because I take the knowing, because everyone knows what's good for you and what's bad for you to a certain extent, right? Like my joke that I make more often than anyone can count is fruits and vegetables are good for you. I bet you've never heard that before, <laughs> right? We know we just don't act upon it. Right. right. And so what stop us from acting? Exactly. What I'm doing is I'm taking the knowing from the mental level yeah. where it's stored to the physical level, to the body, to the belly, to the heart, right? Where when it's embodied, when that knowledge becomes wisdom, right? Whereas you're not getting it from someone else, but you're, it's wisdom, it's from your own experience, right? That's when it sticks. That's when it's going to make changes in your life, when you can feel the effect of the bananas and cucumbers on your pooping, right? Something like that. So, I'm curious, why do you, are you choosing banana and cucumber? Juicing or why am I choosing? Choosing. Choosing. Um, because both of them have a 95 and higher percent water content. Some of the most water containing foods that we can find. Um, and that's what's really going to move the bowel. Um, as well, they, uh, the magnesium in bananas, when it's ripe bananas, it's going to help to move the bowels. It's going to remineralize as well as the cucumber. I mean, the green skin uh, is filled with minerals. And so this is going to help to move the bowel. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting. I'm talking about this now. I would even sometimes include watermelon. My parents, um, for the past probably four years now, have uh, revitalized their life and their bowel habits by having watermelon for breakfast. And so they'll they'll wake up and they'll have hopefully water. And then after that, when they want to eat, watermelon's the first thing that they have. And they'll wait a little bit after the watermelon. They'll have as much as they want, if that's up to a fourth of a big watermelon or something. Uh, and then they'll, they'll go to the toilet. And so there's this peristaltic reaction in the body, which is like pushing everything through. And also the muscular action um, echoing from the stomach onward um, is what helps us to move the bowels. And so, yeah. So watermelon could add that too. So if if I were saying, answering your question just flat out, what can people do to change their life? I mean, I would say, of course, hydration. That's water, high quality water, spring, yes. mineral spring water, drunk on an empty stomach, mm -hmm. right? And then also adding in tons of water containing fibrous matter, which is fruits and vegetables in large quantities. And so if that's a lot of watermelon for breakfast or eating way more bananas and cucumbers, I give you full permission to have five bananas at once right that look like cheetahs they have little dots on them right they're fully ripe they're squishy yeah. so something like this can sounds be. like a good idea i have a bit yeah i might try it quite soon and, and yeah. make it wisdom as you were saying yeah um so i know we've talked about health and detox and simple ways to to make changes in our lives even if we cannot take the time to go to a retreat for example Uh, but at, at the very beginning of this interview, you mentioned the word consciousness. I would like to ask you, because the impression I get, and it's so easy to get that impression, is the immense amount of studies that you already have. I would like to ask you, what got you into health? What motivated you to go so deeply in understanding, you know, detox and I would say how the body works? And yeah, I'd like to know a little bit about that if you want to share. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, the kind of mainstream or the superficial answer, I always found boring. And so I always sensed that there was more to it than that. Um, because I mean, the simple, the mainstream, this lifetime, the answer of the mind is that I, I, young age, started feeling the effects of long term antibiotic use on my body. And um, as I changed my diet, I mean, I, I started eating a plant-based diet um, on behalf of the environment. I was a huge environmentalist um, when I was younger. I mean, still am, but not an activist like I once was. And um, that changed my diet. And as soon as I started changing my diet, my body started reacting and cleansing mechanisms. And so when I started eating way more plant-based whole foods, I broke out in acne and I was bloating and I would fall asleep. And so I originally went on this quest to try to heal myself. Right? I was always conscious about health in, in the way like when I was 10 years old, I remember packing my lunch and looking at the 
hugely misguided American food table and picking, right, two fruits, one vegetable, one this, one that, four of it, like, and putting, packing my lunch by this guide. Like, I remember having that consciousness as uh, even younger than 10, probably. And then on my own health journey, I mean, it wasn't like I was on the brink of death or anything like that, but I was able to find my own balance, and I still am every day finding my own balance, healing myself through a process of, of um, really self-testing and inquiry and um, not just listening to what people are saying and saying, oh, I heard this is good for you or that, mm. <laughs> but thinking critically about it. And um, so that I guess that's the simple answer. Um, the more potent answer that I understand today is that this is my dharma in a way. It's like it's what I'm here to do is work in the field of health and aliveness because that's what health is. It's being fully alive. Right? Being unhealthy is, is being slightly dead. And my one of my mottos is raising the bar on health, right? where we no longer define health as living without disease, right? but rather living with maximum vitality, right? waking up every morning saying, all right, I'm so ready to live today. What are we going to do? Like This feels amazing to be in this human body. How can I fully maximize all of this? And so that's the life that I lead. And I mean, I don't wake up every day like that. Right? What did I do the day before when I don't wake up like that? Right. But um, that is my norm, right? And so I'm trying to raise the norm of society because one of my favorite quotes is Jiddu Krishnamurti. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And that's what we live in today is a profoundly sick society. And so we can't measure our health standard based upon everyone else. And um, so I was saying that, that this is my dharma in a way that, um, for example, about six months ago, I went to get a reading from a priest here in Bali who reads the Akashic Records. We have one scroll of the Akashic Records library here. And... Um, I mean, he said to me very clear, you've, you've been a shaman in your first incarnation, uh, which matches with my astrology chart, right? That I've been a shaman. And he was like, the kind of shaman you were was a, it was like a medical shaman. And so, and then he said to me, and in this lifetime, you'll become a doctor. And I was already a doctor at that right. point. He didn't know. I mean, I had tight leggings on, like I, there was nothing he could have known in no way that I was a doctor. He's like, you'll be a social doctor working with people, which is what I do, right? I'm not working in a hospital. And so um, there's there's a lot of, uh, there's a bigger overarching picture that's brought me on this health journey. It's not something that came from an event in this lifetime of, I had a horrible car accident, I had to heal myself from that. or Like, I know people like that, and people like that tend to be the most inspiring ones to hear. I have a lot of clients like that. Um, and I always say to them, like, you have to share your story. But I'm not someone like that where it's come from, this lifetime is just more of a dharmic thing that I'm, this is what I'm supposed to be doing and this is how I communicate. Yeah. I love it. And, uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing yeah. that. I'd like to ask you, you said that you wanted to raise the standards of health. Mm. And what comes to me is to ask you, what's your approach to our current understanding of health at a social level, you know? You mean the pharmaceutical companies, or it could be the pharmaceutical companies, and it could also be the health and wellness in general. You know, at a mass scale. Um. So before I did any of this health stuff, I was a political economist, and um, yeah, I was I was really into politics and economy and the fact that they're inseparable. And when we look at I mean, we were very well, uh, very well aware of like the military-industrial complex, right? From Eisenhower. Well, there's also uh, a medical, pharmaceutical, industrial complex that's been developed, and so um, the the state of the matter today, and it's led, of course, in the United States, but um, by virtue of that, the fact that allopathic medicine is spearheaded by the United States, we see it everywhere else as well, where doctors are paid by pharmaceutical companies to prescribe certain drugs, right? Mm. And so the fact that our health has actually become a commodity, something that can be sold and bought, is, is a danger. From the moment our food and our health became 
a commodity, it became essentially a threat to well-being. And so that's what has driven the bar so low on health, if that makes sense. And so um, in terms of allopathic medicine, it's, it's incredibly non-holistic um, in that it's very narrow-minded. And I would say even something like nutritionism, nutri <laughs> nutritionism, I like that. No, nutrition as a field, <laughs> nutrition is also very narrow-minded. And it's a byproduct of this scientific approach, this reductionist approach to life. And the fact is you can't reduce life. Life is infinite. And so any kind of reductionist approach is going to miss a lot of things. And so quite often people miss, uh, introduce me, let's say, as a nutritionist. And I'm like, well, I've never been a nutritionist. I never want to be a nutritionist. I don't follow that reductionist science. Whereas I embrace science and the scientific process and the, the process of experimentation and, and clinical studies and things like this are very fascinating to me. Um, it's misses the whole picture and so alternative medicines today in in contrast to allopathic medicine which is the dominating medical force of today alternative medicines are what's revealing the holistic entity and so whether that's ayurveda or traditional chinese medicine or tibetan medicine right or naturopathy we see that okay yeah there's a problem in your toe well maybe that's related to your ear where can we find the interrelation there and um, start to work with the body as a whole and with the entire world and the ecosystems and food as a whole entity rather than trying to put together mismatching parts. And so um, I'm not sure if that really answered your question, but like in terms of what I think of it, I, I think it's massively consumer driven. It's about the bottom line and it's about money. And when it's about money rather than actually healing people or health, that's when we're going to have issues. I mean, and you could look at something like cancer as the greatest spear point of this. How many cancer fundraisers are there? How much money have you, listener, are you given to a cancer fundraiser, something like the Coleman Foundation and Race for the Cure? Um, when you actually look at how much money actually goes somewhere to have done something rather than going into constant research and development, and yet we've only gotten sicker and sicker with cancer. It's um, a bit of a corporate game, right? And this game is being played with greater purpose, of course, and something will come out of it. Um, but to not see that it's a game and to just be more or less um, an unawakened one, like you would call that a sheep, right? Mm. Someone just following the master blindly on the path and going, I mean, there's so much pa a passion and love in cancer fundraising, which is amazing. What if we took all of that passion and love and put it into prevention mm -hmm. and changing our own diet and lifestyle, right? I'll liberally quote Michael Jackson starts mm -hmm. with the man in the mirror, right? And it starts with ourselves. And so, um, I just find that the, mainstream again we'll take this word but this this mainstream the overarching dominating force of both allopathic medicine and the mainstream alternative health movement are inherently disempowering to the everyday person because i mean how many times have you heard when someone gets home what did the doctor say right as if you who's lived in your body for 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 years knows nothing about what's going on inside and so that's my job quite often is stepping back and being a translator and interpreter of the things that the body wants to tell us and starting to listen. And um, we've really voluntarily given our health away to medical practitioners over the past 50 years in a way that humans almost know nothing about the body anymore. I mean, we like Jamie Oliver is showing also we know nothing about food. Kids in the United States think, so, think a tomato is an apple. It's like there's a, there's a significant disconnect that's going on in this world of connection where we're more connected than we've ever been before thanks to the internet and technology. There's a direct disconnection from all naturally occurring things, specifically the earth body and the human body. And um, as part of my great awakening, both spiritual and of into life maturity, I had this visualization, this very clear understanding that what I'm here to do or what I want to dedicate the next at least several years of my life to do are fully understanding the human body and the earth body and more or less how they interrelate. And so um, when you say the human body and the earth body or yeah. you mean the spiritual body? No, the earth body, the earth, mother earth, like things ah, like farming, like Gaia. ecology, Gaia. Yeah, Perfect. totally. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so, and there, it's the same being, right, with the microcosm within the macrocosm, and uh, we work in the exact same way, and the natural cycles of things are the exact same way, and so coming to, to listen to those natural cycles is, is the empowerment. Coming to understand them from an intuitive, experiential level, right, is, is when we really take this forward into health. But if the n even mainstream natural health world is going to follow the allopathic path, which is instead of selling pharmaceuticals, oh, you're going to sell some natural herbs, right? Both of them are medicines where someone's relying on something external to heal themselves. You see that? Yes. So it's this, this viewpoint. And when until we can come back to the natural state of our being and realize that we actually don't need anything to heal ourselves, we need to first just pay attention to what's going on inside. Right? If, if a crying baby is on the floor and you just try to shove at him a pacifier, this or that, right? it's never going to really solve the true core issue of why the baby is crying. Yeah, right. Well, your body is a crying baby, and if you keep shoving in supplements, even if they're natural, or treatments with other people who think that they're going to heal you, right, you're never going back to the essence of self, of what is, of what heals. Mm -hmm. And so, empowerment, right, bringing people back to their own source of power is my life mission, right? That's what I'm here for, not as a way of like, oh, that's what I'm here. It's it's that's what's been given to me. That's what's been put in front of me, and I'm just stepping into that with transparency in that. And so um, empowerment at, at every level uh, that includes knowledge and awareness about what's going on in the world and, and um, things like right, the pharmaceutical, medical, industrial complex. Right? It also includes the understanding of, of how your body's supposed to work in terms of pooping. It also includes the tactile understanding, the physical understanding of what it's like to feel good. And so that's what that's really what I do on an everyday basis in guiding people through fasting, because right? they come back to their body. It's like this huge homecoming. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it does not only answer my question, but oh. funny enough, it answered the questions that I wanted to ask you as mm. well, which were related to what you thought was your main impact mm. in the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, one question that comes to me is, for those who are already sick, and they are still in the paradigm that they need, you know, uh, medicine. They, need, they are into taking drugs mm -hmm. and things like that. They they don't even know how important is food in their lives or how food and emotions are related. All this. If they happen to be listening to this interview for any chance, what could you say to those people? What would be the baby steps for them to take them in a gentle journey of self-discovery mm -hmm. and health, ultimate mm -hmm. health, yeah. but with the quickest, gentlest way. Yeah, I love it. Well, the first thing that very strongly came to me as not an answer from the mind, but of a greater answer, uh, is writing. To write, to that's part of the detoxification, that's part of the elimination of those foundations of health, writing, because someone who's already sick and someone who's let's say, being bombarded. I talked about this chemical input before. They're having a the chemical input, whether that's through pharmaceuticals, right, that they've been prescribed, whether that's through emotional chemical releases in their brain by how people, what people are saying to them, how it makes them feel, right? There's a lot going on and they just need to process that. And one of the best ways to detoxify on the mental and emotional level is pen to paper and just let it go. And you're not writing to anyone. You're not writing for anyone. As soon as you finish, rip it up and burn it. Tear it. Throw it away. Right? That's the detoxification. And so just allowing them to be okay is going to take releasing whatever it is that they're holding inside. That's number one. Um, and that, I mean, in clinical studies, it's shown that writing has a huge psychosomatic release. And um, so this is also proven science. But secondarily, like, what can they do? Um, I would say go back to those four foundations of health and start to change your own diet and lifestyle, your own sleep patterns, right? Go to bed early, wake up early. That on its own can provide so much more healing than almost anything else in your waking life. And then from there, little by little, you'll find your own courage and your own ability to step your own foot one in front of the other, right? Reach out to resources. That's the best 
part about the world that we live in today interconnectedly is that medical case studies today are more accessible than they've ever been before. I can log online right now and tap into a group of 500 people all over the world who are currently fasting, right, and ask them what their experiences are. And never before have we had that kind of ability to tap into other people doing these experiments. And so, um, so find whatever your diagnosis is, whatever your condition is, look up online for someone who had it and has healed themselves. Right? And don't put them on a pedestal and say the trophy. Just allow that to be uh, kind of an awareness, a sparking in your consciousness that it's possible. Right? And then from there, maybe you'll find more people. Maybe you'll get in a community of support where you're talking to each other. Um, and as you build this confidence in your own body and your your whatever your life path is, to come back to that place of knowing that actually this disease is somehow serving you. And that if it's bringing you back to yourself and back to that place of um, awakened confidence, of truth, of, of essence of what is, so that you can go into healing yourself, right? Who knows who else you'll heal further after that? So, um, yeah, I guess writing, returning to those foundations of health and really believing. It's an aspect of it that's trusting, but more than anything, it's just loving and, and understanding that this is happening for a greater purpose and that there is an answer and that you are powerful. That's beautiful, Andrea. Thank you so much. Mm. I feel we've covered so many topics. Funny enough, one thing, one topic that has been coming to my field lately, personally speaking, is the um, topic of pranic nourishment or <laughs> yeah. breatharians, right? So people that can live without food and they all talk about consciousness they all talk about ultimate health and i will just i'm curious to know about your opinion on this. yeah um this isn't something that's part of my dharma it's not part of my path i know that i'm whereas i use fasting as a medical practice and everything i do in eating life is based upon understandings that i've gotten from fasting life um that doesn't include never eating again um yeah if someone's attracted to breatharianism then maybe they're meant to be here to be a breatharian in in terms of my thoughts on it first of all yeah by all means i understand that it's possible there are sages in india who haven't eaten in 70 years um or drunk and it's it has to do with of course with chronic nourishment with getting your source of fuel from a greater source of fuel i mean we see this in photosynthesis in plants why why would we ever think that we can't function the same, right? For sure. Um, but my, it's not, it's not for me. And that's not from a mind standpoint. That's from like a, an intuitive awareness and understanding standpoint. Um, like it's funny you ask because I have Josh Amin's book right here. Uh, I had a dear friend from India visiting me last week and I, I brought it home for him to read because he was curious about it. Um, but this isn't my path, but I've copied this and it's part of my detox library. So I give it to people as information if they're interested in it. Right. So I don't think it's right or wrong. I don't think it's good or bad. I think it's, it's definitely sensationalized, which can be a bit, um, challenging sometimes because for someone who's completely not exposed to anything, and then all of a sudden they hear about the concept of breatharianism, it's, totally laughable and they would roll their eyes and it's perhaps doing more, uh, it's creating more ignorance than light. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's just interesting in terms of Ubud. I love that breatharianism is becoming popular because it makes everything I do look so much more normal <laughs> <laughs> when indeed I'm really <laughs> radical. So that's a great way to see yeah. it. <laughs> I love your answer. Andre, is there anything else you want to share? Um, anything else I want to share about expansion of consciousness? I mean, any message that you're going to be, you know, meaningful. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to chant. Hola. Um, I'd like to chant a mantra. Yeah. Yes. Just a sure. Cool. I haven't done it today and it's, um, it's important that any kind of, um, relationship that I that I get into between like teacher or student that that this is acknowledged. I don't want to put it down because I chant quite loud. <laughs>
talking about vibration at the beginning even before recording so i leave you all with this amazing personal sharing and i'll see you very soon with another amazing interview on 1133 podcast <laughs>